So you can see in this passage that Tacitus is wondering why there's so much similarities, but also at the same time, they seem to be almost opposite in the sense of the rites. Plutarch also says that when Pompey the Great sacked Jerusalem, the only thing he found in the Holy of Holies was the golden ivy diadem that Bacchus wears. Both of these sources, Tacitus and Plutarch, being late 1st, early 2nd century sources, are a little late in the game. But if we go back to Herodotus, the father of history himself, there might be something in there that I think might be interesting for this conversation. Herodotus, who's writing about all the Mediterranean world, from Babylon to Spain to the north in Germany and down into Africa, even India, he's got everyone covered. Not that he's correct in everything that he says, but he does seem to know his geography pretty well. And the question is, what does he say about Israel? Nothing. In fact, Israel as a word is never mentioned by Herodotus. Herodotus lived in the 5th century BCE. This would have been not only after the exile to Babylon, but would have been right when they were coming back during the time of the Persian rule of the Middle East. So the question is, how does he not know about Israel? I think the answer to that question is that Israel just wasn't that big. It might have been a collection of city-states loosely connected through culture. Herodotus writes about the gods that are worshipped in this region. He talks about the Egyptian religion. He talks about the Arabian religion. He talks about the Syrian religion and the Phoenician religion. The Sinai Peninsula, according to Herodotus, is just part of the Arabs. And interestingly enough, Herodotus, when he's speaking about this part of the world, he says that there were only two gods worshipped here. Drum roll. Guess who these two gods are? Dionysus and Venus. Here's what he says. He says, now after the Persians conquered Egypt, they established this system of stored water along the desert road mentioned earlier. But before this time, there was no water available at all. So Cambyses, acquiring information from Phanes and the Heliconesian visitor, sent messengers to the Arabian king, asking him for safe conduct for his army, which he obtained by exchangeable pledges with him. The reason why I pointed this verse out first, this would be the exact route that would lead from Persia to Egypt. This would be the Sinai Judean region. This would be where the Israelites would be dwelling. Maybe he didn't know they're called the Israelites. And this is what he says after this. The Arabians who regard pledges made to their fellow men with special reverence enter into a pledge in this way. Between the two men who wish to make a pledge stands another man who cuts the palm of each along the thumb with the sharp stone. Then taking a small strip of cloth from the cloak of each man, he daubs seven stones that have been set up between them with their blood. And as he does so, he invokes Dionysus and Arania. Upon completion of this ceremony, the man offering the pledge commends the visitor or fellow citizen who is receiving his pledge to his own friends and family who then consider themselves as rightful guarantors of the pledge too. These Arabians believe that Dionysus and Arania are the only gods who exist and they claim that they cut their hair 
to look just like the haircut of Dionysus. They shear the hair around the head in a ring and shave under the temples. Dionysus they call Oral Tot, Orania, Alatot. The interesting part about this is that the only part of this region who would worship only two gods would possibly be the Israelites. Because this would be the time when Asherah and El would be worshipped side by side. Could it be that this is a similar tradition that's not the same as Jerusalem, but maybe a little more south, a little more of a privatized rite with the similar idea, the Semitic version of Dionysus out in the Sinai Desert. Arania is the name for Queen of Heaven. This would have been the title that Asherah or Rhea would have had as well. Another interesting part of that passage was the blood oath and the seven times of dabbing. For purification in Leviticus, it says, the priest shall sprinkle the blood of the victim seven times on the man that is to be purified. The seven times is exactly what Herodotus speaks about. The incense is frankincense and myrrh, onica and galbanum. Popular incenses burned in the Orphic and Eleusinian rites, also found in Arabia for Yahweh and El. Herodotus says when he talks about the Bacchic origins, it is originally an Egyptian custom, so we're already dealing with that region of the world, the same place where the Israelites supposedly come out of. Herodotus says that the Orphics, or Bacchants, wear linen tunics called calorises, which are fringed with tassels around their legs. Over these garments, they drape white wooden cloaks when they enter sanctuaries or when they are buried. However, they never wear wool for to do so would be offend their religious sensibility. In this, they agree with the ritual practices called Orphic and Bacchic, which are in reality Egyptian and Pythagorean. For the participants in these rites also find it religiously offensive to be buried in woolen garments, and there is a sacred story concerning this. The tassels hanging down the garments is exactly what you see with the Levite priest, and they're also wearing white. There's an exact match here 